So you've endured the most heady part, as it were, the hard part of Trinitarian theology. We've got the basic principles down. And let's cover a few little things. Let's remember that God is sample. And that just means that He has no parts. He has no parts. He can't fall apart like we can. We can lose an arm, a leg. We can get hit and lose our memory. Our body and our soul can separate at death. We have parts, as it were. We are a complex being. God is simple. So He doesn't really have a separate intellect from His will. They're the same. God is pure act, pure being, pure existence. So His act is His act of knowing Himself, loving Himself, and all things concluded. That's the mystery of it all. How can God be simple and yet be three persons, have four relations, have processions? That's the way it is. He's revealed this to us. And because we're human beings, we have to think in a successive manner. We think in terms of sentences, propositions, conclusions, discursive way of thinking. We don't think in a simple way, so we have a hard time understanding how God is supremely simple. So our theology is broken up into one, two, three, four, five. But yet the one we're talking about is simple. But if you just keep these ideas, these principles, these theological principles in mind, about what I've already told you, you will be safe. And it'll help you understand why things in God's creation are the way they are. It's very important when discussing and meditating on and thinking on the mystery of the Trinity not to try to imagine in our limited imagination what God looks like. If you've done that, you've already made a mistake. So imagination is really not the realm of Trinitarian theology. Just try to mortify your imagination. We're not trying to imagine what God would look like with one God and three persons. The minute you make an image in your imagination, you've already failed. Okay, that's right from St. Augustine. Try to avoid dropping down to the level of imagination. We're at the higher levels it's simpler levels, and that's why it can be hard. But you know what? It's rewarding. It's very rewarding. The more you get it, the less likely you will ever fall away. Second of all, if we remember our processions, there's two processions in God, but one of the relations in God is also called procession. And I know that can cause some confusion. I'm sorry about that, but that's traditionally, theologically, how it's named. So let's go back. We look at that. All right. So this procession here, the big arrow, that's generation. This procession from the Father and the Son that's called spiration. So this particular relation, this red arrow, that's also called spiration. And this arrow, which is the Holy Ghost, this relation is called procession. So I know that's confusing, but that's the way it's always been done. Now... I hope that we can learn some things about our daily life and the life in the world based upon what we've already learned. We've already learned quite a bit. We've learned that there's a hierarchy in the universe because there's hierarchy in God. We know there's order in the universe. Well, because there's order in God. We know there's personality in the universe because there's personality in God. You see that? We've learned quite a bit already. Where does this stuff come from? It comes from the Trinity.
recollection. If you've ever read the lives of the saints, one thing you know about them is that they were recollected. They were always thinking about God. That's what made them saints, is that nothing of this world distracted them to the point where they sinned. They always had their mind on God. Even as they were doing the most difficult duties, they were thinking about God. So recollection. As the perfect community of persons, God is always recollected. Nothing can distract Him. He never leaves Himself. That's a quote from Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. He never leaves Himself. He's always recollected. He knows Himself eternally. He's internally in love. The Father knows Himself. That's the Son. He knows the Son. That's the Word. He knows the Son. The Son knows the Father. And they're in love. And that's the Holy Ghost. He's never distracted. Nothing can distract God. No evil of man, of men, the world, and most of all the devil, can ever distract God. Don't you want that? Wouldn't that be great? That nothing, even all of hell combined, could distract you from God? It's possible. St. Teresa of Jesus, St. John of the Cross say, when we are detached from sin, when we are detached from all things in this world, all of hell combined cannot hurt us. So, we've seen this in a couple of the lives of the saints. For example, St. Anthony of the desert. If you've ever read his life, he went out in the desert at one time and all of hell came out to attack him in the form of all kinds of beasts and insects and temptations, and they literally beat him up. He overcame all of hell combined. St. Anthony the Great. It's a great story if you haven't read it. Written by St. Athanasius. It's one of the best books ever written about a saint. And then there's the life of St. John Vianney. The devil couldn't get him, and so he finally just came out and had marching bands playing in his house, tried to burn down his bed, tried everything he could. He just couldn't get the guy. In fact, the, the good saint realized that whenever the devil would come around like that, there must be some big sinner coming to me. I'm going to do some penance for that sinner so they'll go to confession. So he'd get some atheist that was denying God and they'd come to confession and change their life. And the devil would even let him know when he's coming, not on purpose. It shows you the devil, he's not as powerful as you think. Get this through your mind. The devil can only use us against us. If there's nothing in us to use against us, he's powerless. What brings that about? Recollection. If you're recollected, you're going to know yourself, you're going to overcome yourself, and you're going to be a saint for long. Why don't we want to be recollected? Because we might find something in there we don't like. It scares us. That's why people don't like going in that cabin for 30 days. Because they're going to see something inside that they don't like. And they're going to run from it. Quick, turn back on the music. Turn on the TV. i got to be distracted. I don't want to think about myself. Or God working on me. Yikes. Okay, recollection in us. The saints strove to acquire the same recollection... And it's the one thing necessary mentioned by our Lord about St. Mary Magdalene. The more recollected, the less things of this world and the underworld of hell can harm us. We'll overcome everything. If your heart and your mind are in heaven, it's as if you were already dead. Can you do anything to a dead body to hurt the person? No, they're gone. If you're gone, you're outside, as it were. You're like St. Lawrence getting burned on the gridiron. Hey, I'm done on this side. You can turn me over. You're getting roasted alive. Like a hamburger. It doesn't bother you. 
Okay, not thinking about self, but God in the self. That's where we get grace. This is a key line. All right? Do we seek ourselves in God or God in ourselves? Write that on your wall. Ask yourself that every day. Am I seeking myself in God or am I seeking God in myself? If you're seeking yourself in God, guess what that is? That's selfish. I want something out of this, God. I'll go along with you as long as I can find more about me in there and have fun and get consolations and feel good about being Catholic or Christian. I want to feel like I believe or I want to feel my faith working. I'm searching for me in God. Oops. That's selfish. You gotta seek God in yourself. And if He's not there, you run to confession so He can go there. And then you work with Him and you get to know Him in there. Now, St. Teresa, she described how there were people in the soul. Okay? There were people in the soul. And those people got to get along, but with God there, they can imitate and model themselves after the perfect community, which is the Trinity, and they will become harmonized and live in harmony. So recollection, you're looking for God in yourself, not yourself in God. When you find God, you want to keep Him there, you want to love Him there, And you don't even need the Blessed Sacrament at times. You can be praying at home and go into an ecstasy thinking about God. That's what the saints did. That's possible. You can pray even outside of church and be completely recollected. Nothing will bother you. Here's a little method on how to recollect. I already said it once. You place yourself in heaven before God. This can overcome any difficulty. Like I said, your body is as it were dead. If your soul and heart and mind are with God in heaven, what would it be like right now to be with God in heaven? I'd be looking at Him. What about the Blessed Mother? What about our Lord Jesus Christ? I'd be looking at Him and the saints. I could get to know them. Then all of a sudden, that temptation you're suffering just goes away. Ah, what's this to eternal life? This is for the pleasure of the body. My body's going to be dead at, at some point. I won't even care about that feeling that I'm looking for. In placing ourselves before God, we can also collect all that we are and give it to God. This is in a certain way to recollect. You can collect and give to God and that is a form of recollecting. So when you sit down to pray or kneel down to pray, give God your intellect. Here's my intellect, Lord. I give it to you. Here's my will. I hand that over to you too. Here's my memory. My imagination. Here's my emotions, my appetites, my body, my old substance, all my stuff. I give it to you. Give it over. You've collected all that it is to be you and you've handed it over to God. That's going to bring about recollection. And so the total consecration to Blessed Mother, to Jesus living in Mary, will help this come about where you're giving yourself completely over to God. This flows from Trinitarian theology. Let's go to the psychological image of the Most Holy Trinity in man. So when I say psychological, what I mean by that is it's mirrored or imaged in the soul of man. Psychology in the true sense of the word, not in the modern sense. Psych means soul. Psychology is study of the soul. So the highest faculties in man are... Three, there's what we call an active or agent intellect. That's how we abstract ideas and know them. 
Once we've abstracted them through the agent intellect, then they're, as it were, deposited in the passive intellect, where we're meditating on them now and thinking about them and pondering what they mean. So I see a tree, and then I abstract. Oh, I know what it means to be a tree now. I understand trees in general. Treeness. Then I can deposit that treeness concept into my passive intellect and just think about it. Noah built his ark out of wood. Moses had a staff of wood made of tree. He put the bronze serpent on a tree. You start thinking about all the wood. And then you start saying, well, the Lord died on a tree. See, you can meditate on that thing. So, highest faculty is the intellect. It has two parts, an agent intellect, a passive intellect. And then we have what's called the rational appetite. That's just the will. It desires love. It has a rational desire, and that's love. These compose, as it were, a man's head and his heart. So once again, St. Teresa of Jesus says there's these like people in the soul, the intellect, the will, the memory, the imagination, all these things. They're like people. They need to get along. Now, for those smart people here that are thinkers, immortality of the soul. All right. What we know by the agent or active intellect and is deposited in the passive intellect and desired by the rational appetite, that is the will, these things are immaterial. The agent intellect looked at the tree and it abstracted treeness from the tree. It left the material stuff behind. It's no longer concerned about this particular tree. It's just think it's simply thinking about trees in general. Okay, that's an abstract universal concept. All right. If our souls were completely wed to our body, meaning that they each and every part of our soul had some complement in the body, then we could never do that. That would be impossible. You could only be like a dog or a cat who would see this tree and that tree and that tree, but never treeness in general. Because we can think of trees in general, there must be a part of our soul that is not connected to the body. That's immaterial, that's invisible. And that we call the intellect. And because we can desire love, not this particular love, so a dog desires love from this particular man, his master, that particular kid, whatever, he doesn't desire love universally, otherwise he could love God. So the fact that we can know and love in a universal way means that we have a part of our soul that is immaterial. Invisible. So that part of our soul is what makes us immortal. It cannot die. You cannot kill that part of the soul. You can put to death our body, and so to speak, the vegetative and all that can die with it, but it won't because it's hooked to the immaterial part of the soul. And so we live on after the death of the body. Where with a dog who has a memory. Dogs have memories. They know what tree they were at yesterday or what their master smells like. That memory is connected to a bodily organ. They die and it all dies with them. Dogs have souls. That's why they're alive. But their soul dies. It's not immortal. Oh, we are immortal. We can think and know in a universal way. That's the argument for the immortality of the soul. Now let's go back to our uh, our picture of the Holy Trinity and see that our psychological overlay fits with God. The active intellect, the agent intellect, 
is the Father. That's the knower. And then, the passive intellect, what is known, that's the Word, that's the Son. So that's very toss. Faith. Then we have the heart, caritas. Man, the Holy Ghost is for man's heart. They line up. This is why St. Augustine used what is called the psychological model to understand the Holy Trinity. So he'd say things like this. There's the knower and the thing known. God the Father, God the Son. There's the lover and the thing loved. Right? The lover, God the Father, the thing loved, God the Son, and the love they share, the Holy Ghost. Now, if we go back, if you remember the relations, there was a relation here that was called spiration. And it was shared by the Father and the Son. If you remember, there's a relation here that's going back to the Father and the Son. It's called procession. That relation is the Holy Ghost. So, Notice that it's sort of like a response. So out of the procession comes a response. Yes! A big yes, a big act of love, a bonding. All right. This helps us understand why it is the essence of the spiritual life is responding to grace. God the Holy Ghost is the relation that as it were, returns back to God the Father and God the Son from whom He was breathed forth. So the essence of the spiritual life is in many ways mirrored by this relation. It is a responding to grace. Responding to God's love. So, our spiritual life, I've tried to model before, maybe you remember, as a tandem bicycle going up a mountain. The mountain of God. You have the tandem bicycle... You're on the front, God's on the back, usually, and that's a situation in which you need help to do an act of virtue. To do an act of virtue, to make it worth something in eternal life, God has to initiate the pedals. He's got to give you that initial push. Let's do this holy act. And then you feel it. Okay, let's do it. And then you cooperate with God and you're pedaling along and off you go. Off you go. So that initial push on the pedals is what we call in theology an actual grace. It's a grace for a particular action. And what you do by cooperating and getting the pedals moving and starting to move the bike and do this good thing that was a response to grace. You said yes to God. And because you said yes, now you're pedaling along and off you go. You're doing your job. The essence to the spiritual life is responding to grace. You can also model the spiritual life like a radio tower. It's got a transmitter and a receiver. You receive something, now you're able to transmit something. You receive a grace, now you can transmit you can't transmit unless you receive something. So God sends, then you can do something with it. Now, what's the longest distance in the universe? And that's this distance right here. The distance between head and heart. God tells us we don't do it. We won't respond. That's why there's so many sinners in the world. You think God hasn't given these people a grace? Listen, God gave them grace. And they said, no, I will not serve. And we're trying to save the day all the time. Oh, don't worry. God's going to be nice to them. Yeah, right. He said, come to me. And they said, I will not. Respond to grace. Don't say no to God. And you won't regret it. He'll, he'll lead you from one grace to another, to another, to another, until you get the grace of glory in heaven. 
which is to see God face to face. It's a very, very serious thing to say no to God. Now just think about it. St. Matthew's at the tax collector's table. God comes along, follow me. Because he followed him, we now have St. Matthew's Gospel. That has affected, we don't know how many people. We read it to this day with great joy and edification. It's got the Sermon on the Mount. With his saying no, would we have the Gospel of St. Matthew? And no, we would not. So if he would have said no, shadows would have been cast upon this world that we have no idea what they could have caused. Saying yes to God has, has effects. We can do incredible things for God or we can become like Judas who said no to God. And cast shadows. Who knows what Judas was scheduled to do? Who knows what we would have today if Judas had said yes? Maybe there would be no Muslims. Who knows what shadows have been caused by people saying no to God? Say yes, that's the key. Why we do not respond. Man often avoids responding because let's face it, it leads back to the Father and the Son. Uh, there's the key right there. Uh, if I say yes to God, then the sun's going to lead me up the mountain and at the top is Calvary. And that means I'm going to have to endure some pain, penance, and uh, mortification. What did Our Lady say over and over again? Penance, penance, penance. What's the third secret of Fatima? Climb this mountain. There's a cross on top. Come on, climb. That's it. We're afraid of that stuff. Some have tried to take a shortcut. They've tried to bypass. Let's find another way. If we can't take that way, I still want to be with God. How can I find another way? Now, if you don't know, that's exactly what Satan wanted to do. Satan was given a chance Come and be with me. And he said, I will not. I can do it on my own. I know another way. It didn't work. That's why there's a hell. There's another way, according to some, they try to bypass the sun, try to bypass the filioque. This is what the charismatics tend to do willy-nilly. They don't mean to, maybe, but they end up that way. And then there's the Protestants, too. We can go straight to the Father. We don't need all this stuff. I can go out and pray straight to the Father. Oh, you can. I don't know about that. Doesn't seem to hold that in the, in the gospel. So what they're trying to do is, willy nilly, whether they will or not, is go to the Father through the Holy Ghost, because He's all love. Everybody likes Pentecost. Fire coming down, apostles on fire, ha! That's what we want. Right? Whoa, 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 wait a minute, what's this? Oh, son? That's all done. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Mass! Representation of Calvary. You Catholics are sick. It's over. Enough of your bloody crucifixes. See? Don't you see what they're trying to do? Trying to go straight to the Father without the Son. Yikes. This is not good Trinitarian theology. God the Father is not known without the Son. This is part of why I want to do all this. Recall the notions. The Father is known not by spiration alone, but also by paternity. You won't know the Father without paternity. You see how our theology is coming to help us now? Truth in God is between God the Father and God the Son. The Word, without going to the Son, we won't be grounded in truth. And we know that's true of the Protestants. The mess we're in today ultimately was unleashed by them. And we're trying to smooch up to them. And it's failing miserably. Now we're trying to smooch up to the world. Can't we all just get along? St. John says, whoever denieth the Son... The same hath not the Father. How do you get around that one? I always wonder how they get around that. I don't know. I've never heard anybody give an explanation. 
Uh, the Muslims believe in God the Father or the God as their Father. Is that so? And they say, what about Jesus? That He was a liar? Huh? That He was just a prophet and Muhammad was a better prophet than the Christ? The Son of God? And you're telling me they believe in the same God we do? Uh, no, they don't. This is not right. All right. Whosoever revolteth and continueth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Revolteth? We don't believe in no Trinity, you Catholics, you Christians. We kill you Christians for believing in the Trinity. Uh, they revolteth. They continueth not in the doctrine of Christ. They hath not God. Come on. What are we trying to fool here? This is the Word of God. It's undeniable. It's clear as a bell. You can't get around these things. Look at the church. The church is a mystical body of Christ. It's a mystical person. She is somebody. How's that? Well, she has a soul. And that soul is the Holy Ghost. She has a mystical person. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us. And so does the church. Thus, she too will mirror the Holy Trinity. If truth is neglected in her, chaos ensues in the church. See, because she mirrors the Holy Trinity. If we neglect the truth, what's going to happen? We're going to lose our image of the Trinity and chaos, disharmony, wars will result. Hierarchical nature comes under attack if we lose our truth. That's happening. It's all legal, egalitarian now, all level. Is often replaced by charismatic model, a more egalitarian. That is a flat model where it's democratic. We're in a circle instead of a pyramidical structure. We're in a flat, horizontal structure where everything kind of comes to the center and the guy in the center says yay or nay kind of thing like a democratic system. Feelings are of importance. Everything is about sensitivity. You're not very sensitive to others. Human love, they use human love to unite and reach out. Human love, not divine. That's where we are, I think, today, unfortunately. We've neglected the truth. We've failed to point out the errors of this time. And now we're reaping the whirlwind. So what will happen is, is that the church will lose her recollection. I mean in her members, I should say. She'll lose her recollection in her members. In other words, religious life will fail. Those that are specially dedicated to recollection, Carmelite monasteries, poor Clare monasteries, these things will fall apart. They'll get TVs. They'll watch movies. They do. And they fall apart. I know one monastery that had up to 40 some members. Oh, they were watching TV and, and movies and whatnot, and they're all down now to five. Five members. Perpetually professed. Now, St. Paul knew what he was talking about in speaking of the cross and always focused on Christ and Him crucified. Now, you knew what he was talking about. This is it. This is it. This is how we find God. This is how we maintain course. No wonder we always start our prayers then in the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. No caritas, no true caritas without veritas. So without truth, love becomes sentimentality, it becomes romanticism. Most people, when they get married today, frankly, they're looking for the romanticism and they're in love, but they don't know what love is until they get married for a little while. Then they discover what real love is. They're not ready for it. That's why there's so many divorces. It's so sad. Now, this is typified especially in Christian marriages. Christian marriages are supposed to show forth the indissolubility, the unbreakable bond between Christ, the head, and His bride, the mystical body of Christ. They're indissoluble. 
this bond of putting the two together, the head and the body, the bride and the bridegroom, the bond is the Holy Ghost. It's unbreakable. It can't be broken. The Holy Ghost is the soul of the church. Just as He is the bond between the divine and the human natures in Christ, so too the church's bond between head and body. He bonds the head with the body. It's unbreakable. Hell cannot prevail. Now, if we bypass the head, no true love, in other words, no true bonding. I'm not going to have any truth. I'm not going to have any true love. I'm not going to have any true bonding. Marriage is based on sentimentality, romanticism, or love. I love you. They're going to fail. They're not going to make it. So here it is. This is one of the reasons why we have to have a priest at marriage. For a valid marriage. Marriage must be before one who is of the Father. It has authority and delegation from the church. That's why we get married before the priest. Here it is. It's part of our Trinitarian theology. Now, let's go back to something I've already talked about briefly. Monotheism, is that enough? Just having God as our Father alone, is that enough? And maybe they don't even call Him Father, but they usually do. But we have a Father and He's God. As we have seen, God the Father is not known without the other persons of the Holy Trinity. Especially since this has been publicly revealed in the Gospel. God went to a whole lot of work for these revelations. They've been around for a long time. Everybody's had a chance to look at these. Why does everybody expect God to go out on the extraordinary level all the time to save a soul? No, wait a minute. He gave us the ordinary channels. And one of them is publicly revealed doctrine. Revelation. The deposit of the faith. It's right here. It's public. It can be known by everybody on the face of the earth who has even an internet access. All you got to do is look it up. There it is. You can find it. No excuse. Muslims and the Jews believe in one God, but they deny the Holy Trinity. In fact, they attack it. They ridicule it. They make movies about it. They spurn it. Can they have true charity? It's impossible. If you do not have the Holy Trinity, you will not have true charity. Because it comes from God. It comes from the inner life of God. He's not going to grant true charity unless you recognize that. This is why there's always wars, wars, and wars unbelievable in the history of the Muslim countries. That's all they know. They make peace at the end of a muzzle. Because they don't have the Trinity. They don't even know what true love looks like. Can they have true peace or true unity? No. Can they have inner harmony when not acting according to the image in which they're made? No. The wars that they're fighting start in there and they flow out there. And the same is true of the Jews. You cannot have true peace, true unity. They will always be at odds with the world around them and inside without the Trinity. I hope this is making sense. And this is pretty hard stuff, but it's true. Without the Trinity, we're never going to have world peace. There's no peace. We can't go over to the Palestine and try to talk everybody into just getting along. It will never work. The only way is to bring them Christ who will bring them the Holy Trinity. That's the only way. This kind of helps us understand why that's the case. Relating and personality. The inner life of God is one act of truth and love. Remember, it's simple. Heaven is entering into this one act for all eternity. Hell is being separated from it for all eternity.
The act is between the persons in God. This act of love. It has to do with relating because the persons are relations. So the more we can relate, the closer we get to being in heaven and vice versa. And relating doesn't mean at the end of a muzzle. Sometimes you have to resort to that. And the church has never condemned it. But that's how a lot of people relate in the world. They have a gun. All they understand is fear. I'm going to make these people afraid because i got bigger guns and more of them. You better do what I tell you. Abba Dorotheus, a desert father of sorts, tried to explain it like this. If you have God at the center and these, you have two different people on these, on these lines. So at this stage, they get along with their neighbor this much. Look how far away they are from God. The more they get along with their neighbor, they, they start relating to each other, deepening their love for each other. They get closer to God, see? So it's like radio lines. The more you fall in love with your neighbor, even if he's a difficult person, whatever it is, you get closer, closer, and closer. You overcome yourselves until you meet each other in God, in heaven. That's a pretty solid look at things. I'll read it to you, in fact. Imagine a circle with its center and radii or rays going out from the center. The further these radii are from the center, the more widely are they dispersed and separated from one another. And conversely, the closer they come to the center, the closer they are to one another. Now suppose that this circle is the world, the very center is of the circle God, and when he says world, he means the cosmos, the universe. So now suppose that this circle is the world, the very center of the circle of God and the lines, the radii are going from the center up to the circumference or from the circumference to the center are the paths of men's lives. Then here we see the same. Insofar as the saints move inwards within the circle towards the center, wishing to come near to God, then, in the degree of their penetration, they come closer both to God and to one another. Moreover, inasmuch as they come near to God, they come near to one another. And inasmuch as they come near to one another, they come near to God. It is the same when drawing away. When they draw away from God and turn toward external things, it is clear that in, this, in the degree that they recede from the central point, and draw away from God, they withdraw from one another. And as they withdraw from one another, so they draw away from God. Such is also the property of love. Inasmuch as we are outside and do not love God, so each is far from his neighbor. It's all about me. But if we love God, inasmuch as we come nearer to Him by love of Him, so we become united by love with our neighbors. And inasmuch as we are united with our neighbor, so we become united with God. So St. Teresa of Jesus says that we will love God in proportion to our neighbor. In proportion of our love of neighbor is our love of God. So look around in your life and find the neighbor you like the least and start working on it, and you will improve your spiritual life. You'll start loving God more. So St. Therese, when she was in the convent, there was a, a sister in there she couldn't stand, and that happens all the time. And she says, I am going to love that sister now as if we were already in heaven. Because I want her to be in heaven with me, and when we're in heaven, we're going to love each other. So see what she was doing? She was out here, and she started moving there, hoping to get there with the sister that she didn't like. So when she died, that sister said, I was her best friend. She must have been successful. Relating power. Now, since God's persons are infinite, He has infinite relating power. Not even the damned in hell can escape from God. Nobody can escape from Him. Sometimes you wonder. Sometimes you see a soul on the street that's so far gone. Someone who's pretty hard bit. 
with the world. They're just a mess. They're just, they've been in prison for years. He did all kinds of crimes. They have no love of God. They kill people without hesitation. And you think, can God ever convert that soul? Absolutely. He has infinite relating power. He can reach down into that soul, touch just the right spot, and they'll go, ah! And we wonder, maybe, why don't you do it? That's the mystery. But maybe they said no to God. He's given them chance. We leave that part to God. That's a mystery. But the point is, He has infinite relating power. If we're willing to sacrifice, He might go and touch that person. Because once again, it's not just God and this person. It's a community of persons. It's all of us together working together to save each other and ourselves in love of God. We're not an island. It's not just me and Jesus. The church is a society. We are commanded by God to go out and make disciples of the whole world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. King David captures something of this when he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy face? I can't. No matter where I go, there is God. This is why even the most hardened sinner, as I've said, can still convert while still in this life. The souls in hell. The church's mystical person has an infinite relating power. She does not need anything outside of herself to help sinners convert. We don't need to be looking outside for better ways to help people. We have it all. It's right inside the church. She is it. She has infinite relating power. Nobody can escape her. She cannot be killed. Stay inside the church, whatever you do. Going back to St. Teresa's interior castle, the people on the inside... We have to realize that we have to relate on the inside. When we fail to relate to each other on the inside, we'll fail to relate to each other on the outside. So the people in the soul need to relate, then I can relate to the people on the outside. Who are the people in the soul? The head, the heart, the intellect, the will, the memory, the imagination. What's the longest distance in the universe? The distance between the head and the heart, between truth and caritas. Responding to grace. That's the longest distance in the universe. Saying yes to God. Now again, truth in the mind and heart, and the heart responding with the help of grace, leads to true love, peace of soul, eternal life. Otherwise, hell starts to take root in this life. We turn in on ourselves. Failing to relate inside leads to failures on the outside. Lies on the inside leads to suspicions and lies and duplicity on the outside. No love is possible for such a person. No peace is possible. So we got to work on the inside, get recollected, and we'll be more ready to work on the outside. That's why we need a spiritual life. That's why we're praying the rosary. Most, if not all, addictions have some failure to relate behind them. There's always a broken relationship behind an addiction. Almost always. Something going on in their life that's breaking down and they try to escape. And they fall into depression. Also, it makes abortion and things like in vitro fertilization very, very stressful to overcome. Because when a baby has been lost, there's a person involved. And that person is now outside of my reach. You know, if I've hurt one of you, I can come down tomorrow and I can find you and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I can't do that with a baby. It's gone. And then the person suffers from a very traumatic thing all her life or his that someone that they can't find to say sorry to is God. So one of the ways that's been proposed to help that is that through the power of the sacraments, which are timeless, a connection might be made and a sorry can be proposed. It does help. But the point is, is that it's difficult to repair because the failure to relate. This is at the root of it. 
in vitro fertilization similar. In vitro fertilization is a test tube baby. That's a baby that has been made in a laboratory. When they grow up, they don't know who their mother and father is. They're not sure because the relationship is all messed up. Because they were not made in their mother's womb. They were made in a lab. There's all kinds of doubts and they don't know. And so there's a relationship failing there. There's whole books written on this by all kinds of in vitro people that are living now. They're like, we do not like what happened to us. Don't do this anymore. It's hurting us. What's at root of it? Relating problem. True love. Why did God give us liberty, we can ask. Sometimes that's an interesting question. Why am I free? If I'm going to sin so much and all these things, why am I free? Why do I have the free choice of the will? So that we can do what God did. What did God do? We know our Trinitarian theology now. The Son returns all to the Father. Aristotle defines a relation as that which is completely referred to another. Isn't that interesting? It has to do with something whose entire essence consists in being referred to something else. So these are relations. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's a, In a sense, we can use Aristotle's definition of a relation to understand that there's a complete giving over of self to the other. The Son returns everything back to the Father. And that leads to spiration. The Holy Ghost gives back all to the Father and the Son that leads to the bond of love in God. That's eternal and unbreakable. So caritas is known especially by sacrifice. That's why we've been given liberty, so that we can give it all back. That's what the total consecration teaches us to do. Give it back. Quit holding on to stuff. Charity is giving everything back to God. Recall our exercise and recollection. I give you my intellect. I give you my will. I give you my memory, my passions, my imagination, my body, my soul. All my stuff, I give it to you. If you did that every day, believe me, your life's going to start changing. You're going to become more recollected. Things won't matter so much anymore. You wreck your car. Well, you know, it's just a car. It's not the end of the world. I still have God. This is also how the world is made. The liberty of our souls is, is mirrored in how the world is made. The universe can be modeled under a certain exitus, reditus theme. Exitus, going out. Reditus, coming back. A going out from God and returning to God. This is seen perfectly in Christ. So we have creation comes out. Christ comes and come back. Creation comes back to God the Father. Christ said, I came from the Father and I go back to the Father. Everything I have is from the Father and I give it all back to Him again. The Holy Ghost will come and He'll teach you everything I've said. See how it all goes together. So this is the model for our will. This is why we have free will. This is why we have liberty. To be like God. To give it all back in love. Sacrifice. This is why religious life, vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience is the highest level of life on earth. Because you're giving it all back as best you can. It's the highest location. It's the perfect state. It's what it's called, the state of perfection. Am I perfect? No, but I'm on the way, hopefully. But the state of perfection is that you are now using your will as it is meant to be. Give it all back. That's what God did inside. This is what we're going to do on the outside. A couple more things. There's this beautiful element to the Most Holy Trinity called perichoresis. Perichoresis. That is a Greek word. What it means is, is there's mutual inherence in the three persons of God. 
without losing their personhood. They are, as it were, in each other. Once again, God's simple. There's a mystery here. Now, this mutual inhering is called in Greek perichoresis or circum in cessio in the Latin. Dwelling within each other, as it were. So, this is mirrored in the Mass. This is why we have three Kyries, three Christes, and then three Kyries again. So, the first set of Kyries, that's for God the Father. The second, the three Christes, is for God the Son. And the third set of Kyries, that's for God the Holy Ghost. But there's three each, symbolizing, okay, this is for God the Father, and then Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is for God the Son, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is for God the Holy Ghost, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They mutually inhere. It's an ancient concept that has been applied to the Mass. It's ancient. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about it. Perichoresis teaches us how God is humble. He self-effaces. Hiddenness. God loves hiddenness. Self-effacement and hiddenness. This allows humility in God. The Father hides behind the Son. So He sends His Son. And when you see the Son, you see the Father. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough. Philip, have I not been with you all this time? Don't you know the Father? You see Me, you see the Father. So He hides behind the Son. And then the Son hides behind the Holy Ghost. He says, don't worry, you'll get to know Me. I'll send the Holy Ghost. He'll tell you everything about Me. But then the Holy Ghost hides behind the church. The visible church. So you want to know God the Father, you need to find the church. When you find the church, you find the soul of the church, the Holy Ghost. He leads you to the Son, the Eucharist. Then he, the Son leads you to the Father. So when the priest is at Mass, he looks down at the host, our Father, Potter and Oster, looking at the host, he's looking at the Father, through the host. This is why St. Cyprian said, no one can call God Father without having the church as mother. Got to go to the church. You won't find God without that. The humble self-efface and seek God in the church and end by finding Him face to face in heaven. Self-effacement. We imitate God's humility by self-effacement. So there's a certain hiding. You got God the Father. He hides behind God the Son. God the Son hides behind the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost hides behind the church. You want to find God? You got to start there. And you'll find Him. That's why the church triumphant in heaven is everybody's in the church loving God through the Son in the unity of the Holy Ghost. Sea of love. And everybody in heaven has a certain perichoresis. They all, as it were, share in each other's delights and knowledge and love. Sort of mutual indwelling going on. The saints even realize this. There's one saint, blessed Elizabeth Trinity, told her mother prioress, I will be within you when I'm in heaven. I will come back. Because when you've got God inside, there can be, as it were, a mutual indwelling. Because it's a living body, the church. The beauty of the Trinity. So who are we seeking? Are we seeking ourselves in God or are we seeking God in ourselves? I hope you strive always to do the latter. Seek God in yourselves and you won't fail. Because when you do not find Him there, you run to confession and you put Him there. What did St. Joan of Arc say when they asked her, are you in a state of grace? If I am, may God keep me there. And if I'm not, may He put me there. Let us always be about seeking God and finding Him and all things will be given to us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.